Alright, welcome to 99% Geek Presents, an audiobook theater podcast. I am your host and writer behind 99geek.ca, Andrew Getze, and this is being recorded on Monday, May 24th at 4.13pm. My goal in life has always been to write for television, but it's a goal I've had little luck so far in attaining. And so I instead I've resorted to self-publishing novels on Amazon, but writing the monthly chapters like episodes of TV shows that people can download at patreon.com slash 99geek or 99geek.ca. Remember, every chapter is released in four parts, a teaser in three acts, and every month features a different book spanning both science fiction and fantasy and every genre in between. That's right. I wrote all the books featured on this podcast trying to make ends meet in what feels like a poverty nightmare. I'm doing all of this on uh, all of this alone, living off unemployment insurance. I don't have a budget. I don't have a team. No editors or producers. I have no backup, no support. I'm completely alone, pro bono, with nothing but my passion for telling stories. And thus, I ask you not to judge me or my work or my production values too harshly. I'm doing the best I can, trying to wear all the hats. Tonight, we'll be reading from Phase Three of Season One of Nine Nine Percent Geek, a chapter of a book entitled Adrift Homeless. Remember, you can follow along by going to 99geek.ca. Chapters are somewhat standalone, but at least make sure you start on week one for the recap. This is not week one. This is chapter or episode number 11 of Adrift Homeless, entitled Still Be Here When You Get Back. And so we continue with week number three. Lanky's Lounge, Rebirth, in Orbit Over Romeria. I should have, I should have said that better. Okay, Lanky's Lounge, Rebirth, in Orbit over Romeria. Just run it by me one more time, okay? Derek asked Steph as she got to the bar and grabbed two mixed drinks from the counter where Lanky had left them for her customer. What exactly do you mean by no? Alec, who she had noticed through the blue mood lighting of the lounge, sitting at the corner of the bar and watching Derek hound at her. Raise his hand helpfully. I can spell it out for you. It's only two letters. I'm working, Derek? Steph said quickly before Derek could turn his frustration on her friend. In case you haven't noticed, it's cr kind of crazy tonight. She left him at the bar to squeeze through the tight crowds of people, lifting her tray into the air and balancing it carefully even as she was knocked around by people beneath it. Lanky's Lounge was more crowded than she'd ever seen it. Everyone come for th their view as the ship was due to launch any minute. The lounge was so loud with conversations and drinking games and general rowdy excitement that Steph couldn't even hear the loud music blaring out the speakers over the chaos. So, there was David and Emma... And this big-ass Blazcar woman was like, You gotta get past me if you want to save the ship. Steph could hear Lieutenant Mickles recount an old war story as crowds of people swarmed around the pilot to listen. So I jumped down the ladder, right? And I'm like, No, I'm gonna get past you. And then I punched her, and then I punched her, and then I kicked her fucking ass. And Emma and David were able to save the ship. All the hundreds of people around her cheered, and Steph squeezed through them to hand the lieutenant her drink order. Thanks, hun, Lieutenant Mickles said to Steph, taking the drink, taking the other drink and handing it to her overweight pilot friend. I think this is yours. Anyone else? Steph asked, looking around at the other pilots. They all got to drink for free as they were the main attraction besides the view. The two twins with pale skin and dark black hair shook their heads, both lounging on chairs around a table, and one had their leg up on the table between them. The blonde pilot beside them raised her hand, though. I'll take a vodka water bar lime. One of the twins, the one with her leg up, the one of the twins, the one with her leg up, looked at the blonde in be bewilderment. What? Steph was pretty sure it was the same twin who had flown her and Lanky from the surface, though she still hadn't gotten she hadn't quite gotten the hang of telling them apart. I feel like there should be a comma there instead of a period. 
but yes, you get what I'm saying. Anyway, the blonde pilot shrugged her shoulders. I like it. All right, Sarah said to Steph. Chibbit here will take a whatever the fuck she just said. And Gillian? The lieutenant pointed to a timid girl who had just joined them. The youngest pilot of the group looked barely older than Steph. That kind of didn't sound like a very good sentence. The lieutenant pointed to a timid girl who had just joined them, the youngest pilot of the group. She looked barely older than Steph. Period. She looked barely older than Steph. Yep, that's the best way to do that. Gillian just smiled shyly. I'll take it just a soda. All right. Bring her a soda and a shot of whiskey. Sarah corrected with a smile. Steph smiled back. No, Gillian insisted. It takes only one drink to make me tipsy. Better make that two shots, then, Sarah told Steph. The waitress gave the lieutenant an understanding nod. Tell us about the battle for the deep desert, someone in the crowd of people around the pilots yelled out as Steph tried to shuffle her way back to the bar. There were murmurs of agreement amongst the others. All right, Sarah told them, erupting into another tale. So they had us babysitting this dweeb, right? This total science geek. Steph finally made it back to the bar, and she relayed the pilot's drink orders to Lanky. You're seriously just going to say no to old this? Derek asked, waiting as he did f for her to return to the bar and gesturing to his sweaty, muscular body as if he was somehow irresistible. Can you imagine? Alec argued from the other end of the bar. Someone being able to control themselves around all that? Uh, I knew it. I spelled irresistible wrong. As soon as I saw that, because my stupid spell jigs weren't working. But that's why i got to be always vigilant. Is that still spelled wrong? Irresistible. Yeah, I need an I, not an A. There we go. All right. You're seriously just going to say no to... All this? Derek asked, waiting as he did for her to return to the bar and gesturing to his sweaty, muscular body as if he was somehow irresistible, now spelt correctly. Can you imagine? Alec argued from the other end of the bar. Someone being able to control themselves around all that. Who the fuck is this twerp? Derek muttered, approaching Alec aggressively. Is he why you won't go out with me? He's a friend. Steph said, putting a hand on Derek's chest. And I'm not just some sexual object you boys can fight over. Lanky put the finished drinks on the counter and she moved them to her tray, taking it back into the crowd. As soon as her back was turned, she could hear Derek close the gap between him and Alec to threaten him. If you touch her, I'm gonna kill you. How do you know we haven't already done touchy things? Alec asked Derek defiantly. She looked back in time to see Derek grab Alec by his shirt. Because she'd never be satisfied with a gross little twerp like you. Boys never learned. Scene change. Ba 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 da ba da. Scene change. Ba 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 da ba da. Scene change. Bum bum ba na ma na ma na ma na. Bum ba na bum ba na ma na. Bridge rebirth in orbit over Ramiria. Delicious water. All right. I was wondering if you were even going to show up at all. Maggie May commented as General Gilbert returned to the bridge. David immediately got out of the general's chair. I'm here, aren't I? The general muttered, settling into where David had just been sitting and pulling out a cigar. David could see Maggie May watch the general with disapproval from the corner of the bright white bridge where she stood with her arms crossed. The general ignored the council leader and instead turned his attention on David. Your girlfriend given your girlfriend give the go ahead yet? He asked the commander. David didn't react to the general's comment about his and Emma's rela uh, relationship. Relationship. I did say friendship instead, but relationship is fine. David didn't react to the general's comment about his and Emma's relationship. We're just waiting on your word, General, he said. General Gilbert leaned back in his chair. The word is given, then. 
Maggie May stepped forward. General, she said sternly, seeing as this is a most momentous occasion. Again, spelt wrong. What is wrong with me? Momentous. I believe that's spelt right, but... Momentous. Yes. Yes, we're good. All right. Maggie May stepped forward. General, she said sternly, seeing as this is a most momentous occasion, perhaps shouldn't you perhaps give some sort of speech? The general laughed. Ha ha ha. I ain't giving no speech, he muttered, pointing at her. You can do it yourself if you want one so bad. I suppose that would be preferable, the councilwoman said, looking to David. Commander. Mr. Dell, David called across the bridge, and Jack looked up from his pilot seat up front. Give the councilwoman ship wide. Chief Officer Blake, open a channel to Hamadius City Prime Central Control. Channel open for ship wide, Jack assured them. Billy was working away at his terminal. Hamania City needs another minute, he told them. They want to broadcast your speech live. There was a moment of silence, and then Billy gave a nod, letting them know Hamania City Control was ready. Maggie May stepped down a step. That sounds wrong. Um, took a step. Oh, she took a step forward. Maggie May took a step forward and down. Maggie May took a step forward and down. To be just ahead of Gilbert and looked up as if talking to microphones in the ceiling. Momentous. Maggie May spoke, and I spelled it right there. And everyone on the bridge looked at her like she was crazy. What does the word even mean? I was about to say, this is a momentous day, and I realize I don't even think I understand the meaning of the word. Billy threw David a confused look. You're alive, he spoke to Maggie Mabe, but she raised her hand to stop him. Oh, that should be Billy. Billy threw a confused, uh, threw David a confused look. You're alive, he spoke, but Maggie May raised her hand to stop him. That makes sense. Actually, I just read it wrong because I'm dumb. It was a momentous day. When I found out that the world was going to end, Maggie May said, and anyone who hadn't been paying attention before was paying attention now, it was a momentous day when our project almost came crashing down on top of us. But now, I don't need to look momentous up in the dictionary to stand here today and know, no! no! That it is a momentous day. I can feel it in my gut, in my very being. And what makes today momentous, what makes today's momentous moment so different from all those other momentous moments is that all those other moments were things being done to us. But we created this momentous d moment. Romerians. The human race and human ingenuity brought us to this momentous day. We willed it into existence with every fiber of ourselves. Scene change. Lanky's Lounge. Lanky's Lounge. Rebirth in orbit over Romeria. The lounge was quiet as everyone listened intently to the mayor's speech. The music had been turned down, and the blue mood lighting washed over everyone's still faces as they followed along, their eyes darting nervously to the view outside the large windows. Everyone aboard the Rebirth is about to embark on a most amazing journey. Her voice continued to talk through every speaker. An adventure the rest of us can't possibly imagine. Their bravery. Is legendary. Scene change. Control center. Prime central station. Himalaya city. Romeria. That should be... Oh, whatever. I don't want to spoil the speech. One, one snap is fine. 
but so too do the people left behind have to be brave. Maggie May's voice continued to speak as everyone in the control room stopped what they were doing to listen. And their bravery is no less important. After today's tests, I will be returning to you all on the surface. And when we all go to sleep tonight, I want to ask you all to do something for me. Look up at the sky, Maggie May told them. That's what I'll be doing tonight, and I want you all to do it with me. Look up at the sky and remember. That sky belongs to us now. All of us. Every single one of us. Today was the day it happened. People in the control room began to clap. Scene change. Bridge. Rebirth. Oh. Bridge, rebirth, in orbit over Armeria. I keep forgetting to do that voice. It's key to this whole thing. I think that is the key to this whole thing. If I could just do that voice every time, then suddenly listeners would come in by the thousands, and my books would sell off the shelves, and I would be made president of North America. <laughs> um, Bridge, rebirth, in orbit over Armeria. Today... We woke up to a dying world, Maggie May spoke out passionately as everyone watched. Even the general seemed impressed. Tomorrow, we can wake up to the future, and who knows what it has in store for us. The mayor slash council leader made a motion, and both Jack and Billy worked their respective terminals to end her transmission. I'm, I'm requesting clearance for them to release into docking clamps. Jack spoke across the bridge. They have given confirmation for docking clamp release. Around David, the commander could hear the distant rumbling of metal releasing from metal. The sound came from his left and right, behind and above and below him. Everyone on the bridge seemed to be glancing around nervously. Everyone who wasn't Jack had stopped what they were doing to pay attention. Take us out, Jack, Gilbert said from his captain's seat puffing from his cigar and ashing on the floor. Jack's hands flew across his console. Activating main engines now, he confirmed for the general. Forward thrust at 10%. Scene change. Scene change. Scene change. It's not picking it up, is it? I was doing the snaps again. I think I picked it up because I got the headset thing going, but... Um, ba -doo, ba -doo. Oh, there's only two scene changes anyway. I was getting caught up in the moment. I'm sorry. Anyway, two scene changes later. Control Center, Prime Central Station, Himalaya City, Romeria. They've, activ they've activated their engines! Someone in the control room commented. Someone else brought up a camera shot of the rebirth and dock on the main display just in time to watch the three large engine exhaust ports at the back of the ship light up and begin to push the immense craft forward. Ever so slightly, the rebirth began to nudge itself out of space dock. Some people in the control room began cheering and clapping, but others must have felt like Senior Officer Dorsey that the celebrations were premature, and ch choosing instead to hold off until after the test flight. Scene change. Bum, bum, ba da ba dum. Scene change. Bum, bum, ba da ba dum, ba da ba dum, bum, ba dum, bum, ba da ba dum. Yankees Lounge, rebirth in orbit over Romeria. Steph could hear the distant rumbling of the engines as everyone in the lounge scrambled over each other to crowd against the windows of the far wall to watch the long arms of the metal space dock slowly roll past them as Rebirth pushed itself free. That was a long sentence. As the arms of the space dock disappeared from view, people started to applaud, and the pilots were quick to join in. Scene change. Boop, boop, ba doo ba doo Scene change. Boop, boop, ba doo ba doo ba doo ba doo Boop, ba doo boop, ba doo ba doo Bridge, rebirth, in orbit over Amiria. We have successfully separated from space dock. Jack's voice spoke across the silent bridge. I'm bringing us around and away from the planet now. There were cheers as people on the bridge celebrated and hugged one another. Maggie May caught David's eye and gave him a smile. Eh, there's a message from Prime Central Control, Billy yelled to the general. They tell us to have a good f test flight, and insist they'll still be here when we get back. 
give me ship wide, David said to Jack. The pilot nodded to him while continuing to manipulate their ship away from the planet. We have successfully left s space dock, David announced to the ship, and we'll be re activating our port drive shortly. Please remain calm. He signaled for Jack to shut off the channel. We we've entered we have entered high orbit, Jack told the bridge, bringing engines to a full stop. Power the port drive, Gilbert muttered. Cat worked at her station as he spoke and set coordinates. C -c -c coordinates set, Cat confirmed. Uh, I'm a aiming to b bring us out about one hundred kilometers from w where the research outpost. Should should be, the computer is now r running the calculations to tr translate the coordinates into the port drive. It's calculating how f far, what direction, and how much ampage and v voltage we need to pass th through the crystal. Cat nodded. C -c calculations complete. P -p Passing information to the port drive in in, in engineering. Gilbert just continued to smoke as she spoke, and when she was done, he gave her. He gave her next command through gritted teeth. Activate when ready. Scene change. Boop, boop, ba doop, ba doop. Scene change. Boop, boop, ba doop, ba doop, ba doop, ba doop, boop, ba doop, boop, ba doop, ba doop. And if too many scene changes now, just wait till week four, uh, which is already written and has so many scene changes. <laughs> just so many. Just constant. <laughs> anyway. Um, engine room, rebirth, in a high orbit over Ramiria. Everyone's like, all right, we're starting off now, see ya. Um, in high orbit over Ramiria. Yes, that's where we are. Engine room, yes. The port drive is coming online now. Senior crewman Lazarus Engelbert yelled to Emma across the engineering bay, even though she could clearly see it for herself. Emma couldn't help but smile as the large device that encased the port crystal began to light up. She and Kat had designed it together, and it was thrilling to watch through the glass case as electricity surged through the crystal and it began to glow, everything working exactly as it was supposed to. The blue glow began to extend from the crystal, shining across the engineering bay until the entire engine room was glowing blue and everyone in it as well. Scene change. Boop, boop, ba doop, ba doop. Scene change. Boop, boop, ba doop, ba doop, ba doop, ba doop, boop, ba doop, boop, ba doop, ba doop. Medbay, rebirth, in high orbit over Romeria. Janet was on duty late that evening, helping Dr. Pross organize their clinic as there was still a lot to do. She was pulling a microscope from a box when suddenly a blue wave of light passed through the medical center and bathed Janet and the room in blue light. In a blue, how about, yeah, let's say that to, in a blue glow. There's two different ways I can describe this, light or glow. <laughs> Pick one, and don't pick the same one twice. All right. She looked down at her hands, the glow making her seem a little translucent. If she really squinted, she could see the microscope through her hand. It was incredible, wondrous. She couldn't help but wonder what her girlfriend thought of it all. Tanya somewhere else on the ship completely, having a big party at Anki's Lounge or something. Janet Miles was really regretting that she denied Tanya's invitation now. Scene change. Boop, boop, ba doop, ba doop. Scene change. Boop. Boop. Ba -do -ba -do -ba -do -ba -do. Boop. Ba -do boop. Ba -do -ba -do. Lanky's Lounge. Rebirth. In high orbit over Romeria. The lounge was bathed in a blue glow, which wasn't too different. Oh, I didn't do the voice. We still have time. We can fix this. Lanky's Lounge. Rebirth. In high orbit over Romeria. Phew. That was a close one. The lounge was bathed in a blue glow, which wasn't too different from how it looked before, except now everyone in the room was glowing blue as well. And Steph could see through them. That was new, too. This is never going to get old. Steph could hear one of the pilot twins exclaim excitedly. A couple kids ran past her legs as they were excitedly playing in the crazy blue glow. There was a tap on, Steph on, St there was a tap on Steph's shoulder, and she turned around to see her ex, Derek. He pointed at her, his face awash with confusion. Why are you purple? What? Steph asked, looking down at her hands, arms, and then chest. Sure enough, Derek was right. She was glowing purple, a very slight but notably different shade than everyone else. She tried to brush it off, rubbing against her skin to no effect. She felt woozy. 
the whole lounge spinning as she could feel herself pitch backwards, and then she was caught by the small by small scrawny arms. You okay? Alec asked as her vision righted itself and she could make out Derek's smirk. Had she fallen, he likely would have laughed. Thanks, she muttered to Alec, grabbing at his shirt. As, at his shirts? Thanks, she muttered to Alec, grabbing at his shirt as she let him as she let him continue to hold her in his arms. Why am I purple? she begged him. I I don't know. He stammered desperately as another wave of blue light approached them. Why? she asked again, feeling like she was about to cry. Why was it always her? Scene change. Boop, boop, boo ba doo Scene change. Boop, boop, boo ba doo ba doo ba doo boop, boo doo boop, ba doo ba doo Bridge, rebirth, in high orbit over Romeria. The port field has fully expanded and it and it is stable. Cat yelled from her science station, the usually white bridge now glowing a neon blue. The d d dimensional wave has already engulfed half the ship. As she said that, a wave of blue light burst through the elevator doors and passed over them, leaving the bridge white once more, the blue glow gone completely. It was as if nothing had happened at all, except when David looked up. At the main screen, he no longer saw the planet beneath them, just the blue of the nebula. I, 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 I'm con con confirming our lo location now, Kat insisted, her hands quickly manipulating her terminal. Uh, I don't know why that's there. Okay, we're good. Oh, 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 we, 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 we did it! Cat stammered out in shock. We're, we're on the edge of our s solar s s system. The cigar dropped from General Gilbert's open mouth. Industrial district, New Bajan, Romeria, Southern Hemisphere. I forgot about this scene. This is like the scene. All right. <clears throat> Water break. Do, 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 do. Water break. And, like, next week is even more insane, I'm telling you. It's just, like, balls to the wall. Anyway, we're in the Industrial District, New Bajan. Considering how hot it was outside across the planet's surface, John was shocked at how cool it was inside the dome. He almost wished he was wearing a jacket, and hugged himself tightly as they continued their slow trudge onto the, a street filled with industrial-looking buildings, large and gray and drab. It was a stark contrast to the radiant blues and greens of the clean residential zones they had just passed through. They entered a factory-like building, their footsteps echoing in the large, many-storied empty room, empty room, and came to a stop in front of what looked like a very thick, shiny metal flagpole in the center. It was thick enough for someone to easily fit inside if hollow, and sticking seemingly out from the ground. Do you, <clears throat> do you know what this is, Colonel? Lady Fansrick asked Colonel John Adams as he looked around the large, empty industrial building. There were pipes running from the large metal tube, from the large metal tube, and computers around it with temperature readings that all suggested it was almost zero degrees in there, though none of the temperature gauges quite matched. One said plus four. One said minus three and one in the middle just said zero. The only thing they could seemingly agree on was that it was cold. Looking at Tamika, he could see she was even colder than him, even though she at least had her pilot's jacket. John gave an exaggerated shrug. It's a large stick in the ground, he suggested, hoping they would leave soon. The old lady laughed. A slow, hoarse laugh. <laughs> the man pushing her wheelchair remained silent and unreadable. <laughs> Very good, she said to John when she was done laughing. Yes, 
You are quite right, of course. But this stick in the ground, as you call it, Colonel, is our city's very salvation. She pointed to the base of the pole. It runs deep, you see, draws from the cold lower layers of the planet. We have managed to tap into a deep ice-cold water reservoir, deep under the ground, and this building uses the cooler temperature of below to act as an air conditioner of sorts for our entire dome. And the water is drawn from the reservoir freely to provide free, safe, drinkable water for all our citizens. This pole in the ground is our Project Rebirth kernel. She looked up at him from her wheelchair. This is how we intend to save our people, not running away. We're not cowards, Colonel. I had an engineering professor in university, Tamika said, claim that he designed this thing. A high honor indeed, pilot, the old lady told Mika. Tamika shook her head. He didn't think so. He was convinced that it was dangerous, that were volcanic activity to ever renew in the area, the water you're tapped into would heat and come to a boil. Yes. Lady Fansrick said with a nod, I have heard such rumors. Lucky then for us that there has been no volcanic activity in this area for generations. Tamika leaned towards John. The professor said that if it were to happen, she muttered to John, the pressure would build until this whole thing burst, and then the dome would quickly fill, drowning everyone in the city in boiling hot water. Solar hells, John muttered. It wasn't a nice thought. Well, they say you cannot achieve greatness without a little risk, Lady Fanzerk grumbled. Coffee crisp? I like my coffee crisp. No, I like my coffee crisp. Sorry, that's not part of the scene. <laughs> uh, all right. So the last thing she said was, Well, they say you cannot achieve greatness without a little risk. Lady Fanzerk grumbled. Tamika nodded. Yeah, she said to the old lady. That's what the science community told him as they ridiculed him dropped him from the project and dragged his reputation through the mud. She looked at John. As you know, those that can't do teach. What would a pilot know of such things? Lady Fanzerick spoke from her wheelchair, looking at Tamika with venom in her eyes. John suddenly remembered something from her file. You're not talking to just any pilot, John told Lady Fanzerick. You're talking to Tamika Devis. Immediately, Lady Fansrick's head whiplashed back to Tamika, suddenly eyeing the woman with renewed respect. Daughter of Suma Devis, he added, though he knew she was already aware. Tamika punched him. I thought we weren't going to tell people that. I'm sorry, princess, Lady Fansrick said, bowing her head and smacking her servant until he bowed as well. We did not know we had royalty in our presence. Tamika looked at John confused. Lady Fanzerick changed her name. John told Tamika, Lady Sable Fanzerick used to go by Sable Tayuk after her father. Tamika still didn't get it. She's half Blazkor. There are some of us who still remember the old ways, Lady Fansrick said, looking more animated than ever in her chair. Tamika looked confused to John again. I'm not one of those people. That didn't seem to concern Lady Fansrick, who grabbed at Tamika's hand hungrily. 
My father left the country during your great-grandfather's experiments. Your family did so much to destroy our country. Tamika looked scared for a moment. But you are not to blame for the sins of your family. Lady Fanzerick slammed her fist on her wheelchair armrest. My father taught me all about the real Blazkor. The old Blazkor. We were once strong. We were once noble. The lady was almost screaming now, her voice echoing around the room, as for a second John thought she might even get up from her chair. But then she collapsed back, peering up at Tamika. I see the Blasgore spirit in you, princess. Lady Fanzerick looked to her servant and frowned. Had we known royalty would be coming, we would have made you a feast. She then turned her attention on John, and the colonel wondered if his impatience was painted on his face. But this is not what you wish to discuss, is it, Colonel? I want, I want what you know about General Gilbert, John said, hoping she might finally be willing to get to the point. Yes, the old lady spoke from her wheelchair, nodding. Gilbert, she repeated the general's name while I took a drink of water. <clears throat> Gilbert. I like the way she said that. Gilbert. It's all about the gil and also the bach. Gilbert. Understand something, Colonel. I also like the way she says Colonel. Colonel. Understand something, Colonel. This is not an easy topic for me to revisit. We came here to this place that brings me much comfort. I'm losing it. More drink. We got this. All right. We came here to this place that brings me much comfort so that I might allow my mind to think back on those days. It has taken much therapy for me to come to terms with what happened. It's been so long now. I'm not even sure I know how to start. John knelt down so he was at the woman's level and placed his hands on hers. Start with how you met the general. Lady Fanzerick leaned back and closed her eyes. When I first met Gilbert, I was just a child, she began, and he was no general. My family ran an orphanage, you see, she continued, and worked especially with undocumented children helping them get the documents they needed to get into schools or even the military. So Gilbert was one of the kids your family helped? No, Lady Fanzerick interrupted sternly. He was no child, maybe forty-five years of age. He was already beginning to gray. That doesn't make any sense, Tamika said, though at this point John was more used to nothing making sense in this whole investigation. He's maybe 55 or 60 now. How does someone only age 10 years in nearly a century? Perhaps now you understand. Why, when I heard of your General Gilbert's... 
everything I heard of your general Gilbert's exploits, I did not even entertain the notion that he could be the same man who caused me so much agony. Why? Tamika asked. What did he do? Lady Fansrick let out a long, forlorn sigh before continuing. He wanted papers. A new birth certificate. When my father asked him who his parents were, he said he didn't have any. They told him the military would do a background check on his parents, but still he insisted that he had none. Then they told him the military wouldn't accept that. He asked that they put themselves as his parents. They of course insisted that this too was impossible. No, that no one would believe he was their child. He was as old as they were. John could feel the old lady's hand tremble in his grip. He became enraged, Colonel. Your general threw a gas lamp at the wall and started a fire. I was able to get out with the other children of the orphanage. But when I turned back to face the door, my parents were nowhere to be found. I watched that building burn to the ground, Colonel. Neither my parents nor your general escaped with their lives. She frowned. At least that's what I have believed for all these years. But he did escape. John said, and he used, <clears throat> but he did escape, John said, and he used your parents' forged papers to enroll in the military where he's been rising in the ranks ever since. But then, who is he really? Tamika asked, finally cluing into the mystery that had been plaguing John. And where did he come from? Colonel, Lady Fansrick said harshly, if your general is my Gilbar, then I want you to kill him. The hate in her eyes was piercing. Avenge my family, Colonel, and I will pay any price. John got to his feet. Lady Fansrick, she said to the woman. He, he said to the woman, I'll do this one for free. Scene change. Boop. Boop, boo doo boo doo. Scene change. Boop, boop, boo doo boo doo. Scene change. Boop, boop, boo doo boo doo. Boo doo boo doo. Boop, boo doo boo. Boo doo boo doo. How good was that last scene, by the way? Maybe it's just because I really like doing that voice. I know it's not a great voice, but I love doing it. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Bridge, rebirth, edge of the Romerian system. Sc scanners are. P Picking up debris from b b both the outpost and the c c comm s satellite, Kat yelled across the bridge as she worked the controls. On the main screen, old David could see was the blue of the nebula. Around him, people were scrambling to record data, study studying readings, and uh, was scrambling to record. Okay, let's try that. Try this again. Around him, people were scrambling to record data, study readings, and check in with every department to ensure that. There had been no complications from the port jump, but David, along with Gilbert and Maggie May, were all focused on Cat. Can you tell me how it happened? General Gilbert asked the young chief officer Pross. Uh, I can m make out. I I can't make m make out anything c c conclusive. Cat answered him. Th though based on the sc scoring I I'm seeing on the d d debris. C coupled with the bending on the uh, edges, I I I can hi hypothesize that 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 they were were hit with with something hot from from outside, p p p p p possibly a w weapon of s some kind. 
when are you guys gonna believe me? Cadet Kevin and Jelly, uh, Angeli asked the bridge. It's an attack! Gilbert sighed, and then suddenly got out of his seat. Everyone on the bridge looked at him. I'm gonna go get a closer look down below, he said to them, making for the elevator. Doctor, you got command. Good luck. He got into the elevator, and then he was gone. David looked at Kat. And then Maggie May. A closer look? David repeated out loud. He looked back to Kat, who was frowning deeply. Uh, I could have g given him a any kind of l look he w wanted fr from here. Maybe he just got tired of hearing you stutter. Billy commented from the comm station. Cadet Angeli gave the kid an approving sneer. Hey! Maggie May exclaimed from the other side of Gilbert's now empty chair. There'll be no more. There'll be none of that on this bridge. David agreed with the mayor, scowling at Billy as the doctor settled into the captain's seat. He turned his head to Cat. Can you pick up anything in the nebula? Th that that's c c kind of the, the p problem with, with the, the ne nebula, right? Cat stuttered. The, the, the outpost was working with sp 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 specialized p probes for st tr transmitting back. Listen to her, Billy exclaimed excitedly. It's getting worse. She's just a fucking faker. Could you sh shut the sack up? Jack said from the front of the bridge. That's what happens when you point out someone's stutter. They become self-conscious of it, and it gets worse. As for why the general left, he'd probably want to get away from you because you're fucking asshole. Asshole. Facking, sorry. Facking asshole. And also your superior officer, Chief Officer Billy said smugly. What's your rank again? Oh, that's right. You don't have one. Jack got out of his seat. Means they can't court-martial me when I kick your ass. He threatened, moving towards Billy and making the, the diminutive comic comms expert cower in fear. Did that? Did you get all, get all that? He threatened, moving towards Billy and making the diminutive comms expert cower in fear. We can do sentences. We can do words. We can do this. It's almost over anyway. David shared another tired glance with Maggie May and could see she was as tired of it all as he was. They needed General Gilbert. Where in all the solar hells had he gone to? David pushed a button on his armrest. General Gilbert, please report to the bridge. General Gilbert, report to the bridge, thank you. Maggie May gave him an approving nod. Boys, st stop! Cat yelled from her station as Cadet Angeli got up to intercept Jack. P -p please, there's something else! What do you mean? David asked. You've found something in the nebula? Cat shook her head. N n not the n n nebula b b behind us. She looked up at David apologetically. I, I, I would have n n n no noticed it sooner, but, but, but I was f focused on w w what was in, in front of us. Th th they look like m multiple contacts, she continued, bringing up a radar-like display onto the main screen. Holding you in suspense while I add some stutters that I forgot to add. All right. They l l look like m m multiple contacts, she continued, bringing up a radar-like display on the main screen. Their ship was in the middle, and on the very edge of the radar behind them were three blips. The three l large ones, based on their tra 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 trajectory. They ca came from our p p present location. And are cur currently about seventy percent of the way along an in intercept course with Ramiria. All right, let's try that line again. Okay, they l l look like m m multiple contacts. She continued, bringing up a radar-like display on the main screen. Their ship was in the middle, and on the very edge of the radar behind them were three blips. 
three, three l l large ones. B b based on their tra 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 trajectory, they came from our p present location and are c c currently about 70% of the way along in, in, in an, an intercept course with R Ramiria. Kat looked up at David again. S sir, she said, I'm r reading e energy spikes off the scale. I'm r reading powered propulsion. Again, I messed up the... Alright, let's try that again. Kat looked up at David again. S sir, she said, I'm reading uh, energy spikes off the scale. I'm reading p powered propulsion. I b b believe Cadet Kevin and Gelly was r r right. I, I believe we are under s some some kind of attack. David didn't like the sinking feeling in his chest. Can we port back home? He asked Kat. She shook her head. The c c crystal requires a minimum one hour cooldown, she told the commander. Even if the j j jump was a small one. How long will it take us to get there at full speed? David asked. F f Forty m minutes, Kat answered him. F f from what I can tell, at their sp speed... They p probably left the spot ten, ten minutes ago. And they'll m m make it to our planet in le less than five. So everyone on the planet was going to be completely on their own for the next half an hour. David pushed a button on his armrest again. General Gilbert, please report to the bridge. General Gilbert to the bridge. Please. Thank you. And that was the end of week three. I hope you enjoyed week three. Um, remember that uh, week four is already written and complete, if somewhat unedited, as even after editing week three, that ended up still being somewhat um, unedited, I thought to make a bunch of changes and stuff, but, uh, I hope it wasn't, uh, I hope, um, my horrible reading and horrible everything didn't somehow interfere with the story, which I hope, uh, was pretty strong nonetheless. Um, I can't really say for sure, but it felt like it was pretty intense, and I know week four it just gets even crazier from there. Um, I guess I will jump to the part we all know and love. My name is Andrew Getze, and my brand is 99% Geek, found at 99geek.ca. I'm a writer writing monthly chapters of novels like episodes of TV shows, releasing them in four weekly segments, a teaser and three acts, on Mondays at noonish on my Patreon page. Every month it's a different book, over a range of genres, and they sometimes even cross over and connect. At the end of the month, the finished chapter is added to the PDFs attached at the bottom of every post. Finally, the finished books are self-published on Amazon. There's a dark fantasy story about a post-apocalyptic world where powerful royals rule and enslave the remaining people struggling to survive on the last remaining landmass. There's also a sci-fi story about a people on a dying world who have to build a ship to a new one, but their project is almost brought down by a terrorist organization within their own ranks. Finally, there's a crossover story where characters from my other books are brought into the distant future where the princess of a far-advanced civilization, one that lives in a solar system-sized megastructure around a Dyson Sphere, needs help defeating her twisted, power-hungry brother. And all these stories will be outside the paywall for all to enjoy as new episodes release weekly and the finished chapters will be, re 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 and the finished chapters will be attached to the bottom of every post on the site in convenient PDF format readable on computers, tablets, ebook readers, and phones at the end of the month. But that's not, that's not all my stories. There's also urban fantasy tales about a teenage girl turned into a vampire against her will, or a scorned lover investigating paranormal phenomena, or a journalist covering news and politics in the Middle East. Uh-oh, I think my recording died, but oh, well, we're gonna, well, I mean my stream died, but we'll just keep going. Um, there's also urban fantasy tales about a teenage girl turned into a vampire against her will, or a scorned lover investigating paranormal phenomena, or a journalist covering news and politics in the Middle East. And there's a fantasy story about a fallen angel trying to stop the end of the world, 
All these stories are published and available on Amazon, and are also safe and sound behind the paywall in PDF format attached to an archive at the top of my Patreon page. Only viewable by subscribers, my entire library of work, thousands of pages worth, is easily accessible to every subscriber at any level. There's even a Geekly Weekly blog which covers all the news you may have missed over the week as well as ranks a week's worth of television and makes predictions on what new pop culture things might be in the public consciousness for the next week. It releases every Saturday at noonish. Finally, I do video game streams, both multiplayer matchmaking as well as single player campaign playthroughs. You can see me play games like Final Fantasy, Call of Duty, Hitman, and more. Watch them as they happen at twitch.tv slash wingcommander4 or wait till I release the recorded videos on days when I have nothing else to release. And you can see that, see it all in one place. So stay tuned and maybe subscribe. It's only a dollar and the support you show will go a very long way, I promise. I, there are also higher tiers. Give $5 one month and you can name a character or location or suggest a thing you might want to see. Basically, you get to give a noun and then I promise to incorporate that noun into one of my stories somehow. Maybe not the same month you give the suggestion, but within three months, guaranteed. No matter how crazy, you can't sabotage me, I promise. Think of it like a fun improv game, and you can keep giving nouns for every month you pay at the $5 tier. Or if you give $10, you don't get two nouns, but you can give a description to go with your noun. Describe the personality of your character, or the look of your location, or the importance of your item. For $10, you get a noun and a description. You can also give a dollar towards supporting my efforts at video game streaming, or my weekly blog if that's more where your interests lie. And all subscribers at every tier will get early access to my writing, unedited but released a week early if you finish the current week and feel excited to find out what happens next. I'm as poor as it gets, living paycheck to paycheck and sometimes starving. So I understand if you are too. I don't want to take food out of your mouth. Your attention is enough. Say something, comment here, or at the very least follow me on Twitter at Andrew Getze or Instagram at WingCommander4. Remember to leave a review if you read one of my books. Any reviews on Amazon slash Goodreads or subscriptions here or comments on social media will just encourage more people to check out my work and allow me to grow. I can't do it without your efforts. That's three different ways you can help. Write reviews on any site that lets you. Subscribe here for as low as a dollar. Or at the very least, use your voice to let me and the world know what uh, no, uh, you like what you read here. Live long and prosper. May the force be with you. Long live Marceline the Vampire Queen. Remember that Kong bows to no one, but Godzilla is king of all monsters. We are the 99% Geek.